Welcome to the Stefan Levira Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the show. This is Stefan Levera Podcast, episode 29. And this, my guest today, it's really special. It's like super sci- cypherpunk. It is Samurai Wallet Dev. So welcome to the show. Ah, uh, thanks. It's good to be here. A uh, big fan of the podcast. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I like the uh, work you guys have been doing. So um, just for the listeners who are a little newer, many people in the Bitcoin space operate under a pseudonym. And obviously, as I want to not dox people, I, you know, if they're, if they're coming on the show under a pseudonym, it's under the pseudonym. So uh, just a bit of a quick intro. Samurai Wallet is a really interesting project and I've been following it for some time now and I have um, played around with the wallet myself. I thought it was quite an easy and simple, good Bitcoin wallet. Now, the developers of Samurai Wallet definitely have not shied away from controversy and they will take what you might call a more hardline stance on privacy, which is also pretty cool. So maybe we can just start with that one, uh, Samurai Dev. Um, with the ethos and the mission and, and privacy, I noticed on your website you've got this tagline, we are privacy activists who have dedicated our lives to creating the software that Silicon Valley will never build, the regulators will never allow, and the VCs will never invest in. We build the software that Bitcoin deserves. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about this tagline? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, be, before I do that, uh, just I just want to be clear. I, I'm actually a Samurai Wallet, and Samurai Dev is who's at Samurai Dev on Twitter is a uh, is is the primary dev. So I, I don't oh, okay, do I don't it, do the primary it. dev work. Um, Samurai Dev and I started Samurai Wallet together uh, back in 2015, and uh, we wrote that tagline together as kind of our uh, our mission statement and it's 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 uh we wanted to make sure that however big the project got and however however uh, many people used it we stuck to our initial vision um and the vision that we we had for a bitcoin wallet uh just by design it would not be interesting to to vcs um however we also had our own negative experiences with uh, VCs in the past, uh, both separately and together. So um, we decided that's not something that we wanted for for this type of product and this type of project. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, you guys are, are part of what is called the Zero Link Framework, which is basically about providing additional privacy in Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, one of my prior guests was Adam Fitchor, who is the CTO and the lead developer of Wasabi Wallet, who is another uh, wallet who are you know, software, who are part of the Zero Link Framework. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you think in terms of breaking heuristics and how that helps in t- from a privacy point of view yeah sure yeah uh, so zero link uh was a was a is a great uh, you know a uh, framework adam adam came uh got in contact with us uh, a year ago i believe or a little less than that and and asked samurai dev if he would be willing to to contribute and work on the uh, the framework so we we were totally thrilled with that we like we like it when people reach out and want to work together, so we were, we very happily um, collaborated on the zero link framework and and um, started work implementing it immediately. Uh, so our our um, our implementation of the zero link framework is is called Whirlpool, um, <clears throat> and it's one of the well, it's kind of like the the ultimate uh, tool in our in our suite of tools. Um, all of our tools are designed to break the heuristics used by blockchain analysis and, and, and more generally kind of blockchain spies, I would call them. Um, the idea is, I guess, if, if you subscribe to the idea of taint, so some, some transactions are tainted, uh, some UTXOs are tainted, quote unquote, and I use very heavy quotes, uh, then we're going we're gonna to play your game, but we're going to make sure that everyone's tainted. That there is no untainted, and the way you do that is by attacking the assumptions that that um, these analysis companies have been making, because wallets have been making it dead easy for them to do that. And by attacking those assumptions, uh, you really throw a spanner into into the main driving forces of of how they create the 
this taint, quote unquote, and how they create blacklists. Uh, so, I mean, it, 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 it's fun. It's fundamental to the fungibility of the token, and that's why, you know, from an ideological standpoint, we, we you know, we're we're involved. Uh, but from a, a utility standpoint, the value of the token is uh, fundamentally undermined if there isn't some sort of fungibility aspect of this thing. Right, and then there are multiple ways that your privacy can be broken. Right, so obviously just straight on the transaction layer, depending on obviously the heuristics that are applied, such as if multiple UTXOs are merged into one transaction, then chain analysis companies will try to assume that, oh yes, this these two UTXOs must have belonged to the same person. And then there's also the network attack level. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the ways that users can, you know, try to use these tools to defend their privacy? So, sorry, um, can you can you kind of repeat that? Kind of yep. So just bit. talking about how you have to consider the different angles by which you can be, uh, let's say, fingerprinted or right. de-anonymized. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about you know the network attack angle, or if there are any other kind of angles to think about. Oh, uh, there's there's all sorts of angles. The primarily, uh, honestly, the primary way the chain analysis um, and and general intelligence gathering works on on the blockchain is 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 off blockchain it's leaving social metadata around uh it's connecting addresses to yourself by putting them on twitter um or on your you know bitcoin talk signature uh all of this stuff is is considered in a good analysis platform um it's not it, it's not just like you say on chain stuff uh I, I mean it can come down to to um you know fingerprinting the type of um way the way you're connecting to the network uh tor um vpn if you're using a known vpn all of this stuff uh, ties into building a social profile uh, of yourself and these are these are all different different security concerns and privacy concerns what what our main focus on is uh, is on on on-chain privacy um so if we what we what we want need to focus on or what Samurai wants to focus on is the user being able to create transactions that uh, prevent prevent them from being targeted or or uh, yeah well yeah targeted like de-anonymized not even not even de-anonymized just targeted you know think of it this way you you are an innocent Bitcoin user you are just a guy. Who received some Bitcoin, and little do, did you know that this Bitcoin that you received from a, a buddy, you know, he maybe it's your first Bitcoins, you know, are somehow considered tainted because they're they they're they're connected to the Mount Gox coins in some in some capacity. Well, you're going to get binged for that, you know, the minute you go and send those a shapeshift to buy, you know, your first light coins, which you would probably do uh, as a new. That's it. Shapeshift um, chain analysis kicks in, and th- that's locked. And now your experience is completely negative. And, but you're innocent, you know, entirely. Samurai's goal is to prevent that type of thing from happening. Yeah, and I think another thing you guys have done recently is the digital removal of fiat, um, which I thought was really <laughs> controversial, but at the same time, actually a good thing once once you think about it. Let's talk a little bit about that. I know you copped a bit of flack online for that. Less than I thought I would. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. You thought you would get more. <laughs> uh, no, it was actually, yeah, the the response was a lot more supportive than I ever would have guessed. I thought it was going to ruffle a lot more feathers than it did. Um, look, th- there wasn't there wasn't a huge, we weren't trying to make a big point. We weren't trying to say that, you know, we need to drive uh, some sort of uh, of circular economy or something like that, and you should only think in terms of BTC because that's not the reality of the real world. You know, uh, everyone at Samurai uh, has been has been working for and living off of BTC uh, for for many years, and we we understand the implications of the real world and using this in the real world. However, you know, I've noticed over time that 
the education, we always say it's an education issue and that, and we blow it off as, oh, it's an education issue when it comes to new users and needing to wrap their mind around these, these incredibly complex concepts that Bitcoin comes with. Uh, and we take that for granted sometimes as, as users who have been involved in this for a while. So we, we always, you know, that's it's an education issue, but the issue is no one is educating. And by leaving fiat in the wallet, that's that uh, in the Bitcoin wallet, that's acting as a crutch for the user where they never have to learn. And you would, I mean, we've had users who have been using Samurai wallet for, you know, seven, eight, nine months, 10 months, even a year uh, in the extreme circumstances who would have emailed support and have talked, you know, in complete fiat terms, you know, oh, I sent 250 to this guy, uh, $2.50 to this guy, but now it's three three seventy five. What's going on? Uh, you know, or they they send the wrong amount to a, a BitPay QR code um, in a different, or they send yeah they send some amount to a BitPay QR code in a different wallet, and when they come back into Samurai Wallet, it shows a completely different fiat value. They think they're being ripped off, and you would expect that from a very new user, but from a user who's been involved for twelve months, it's 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 kind of unacceptable. Um, so. Our rationale is, look, we're not a USD wallet. We're not a fiat wallet. We'll, we'll stop reinforcing that within the wallet and rely on the merchant to set the price, which is what happens anyway today and what was happening anyway before and which was the cause of most confusion because the, the two prices never can, you know, or very, very rarely uh, converged. So some, uh, it was always off, you know, um, so we just made, it was very much a practical decision. It was like, hey, we need to streamline things. We need to get support support requests down. And and on those metrics, it's been incredibly successful. Support requests are down uh, in terms of the fiat issues. That's That's been resolved um, as yeah, far as we're so concerned. And so what sort of customer support, um, what sort of problems were you having? With, was it customers coming to you saying, oh, no, you sent the wrong amount, that kind of thing? Well, so there, there was plenty of that. There's plenty of that, but there's also plenty of legitimate support requests that were complicated by the user referring to the amounts that they sent. Or if let's say the issue was, oh, I don't see, uh, you know, my change or something like that in my wallet. Usually, it's like a Tor issue or something it needs to be re rescanned. Um, but it's very difficult to determine, you know, what what UTXO they're talking about. Because there's no, you know, 799 can mean a lot of different things in the <laughs> in the context of like two weeks in Bitcoin. That can be a very different amount. So it's very, it, it takes a little bit more back and forth between them to figure out, okay, exactly what the issue is and, and to get the resolution. Now, there's one, one guy doing support on Samurai Wallet. And there's a lot of support requests that come in. So we need to figure out, okay, how do we how do we maximize this guy's time the best? And the only way to do that is to reduce the 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 issues that are coming in. Um, and maybe it's drastic, but this is one way of reducing that issue. And it's worked because the you know the we, we, one we stopped with the silly sort of hey I I sent you know two fifty, um, but now it says you know three seventy five. You know, we stopped that almost completely. Uh, maybe just just a few stragglers on old versions, but um, now the, the the legitimate support requests they take uh, less amount of time to complete. So I think it, you know that was successful. And you know the other metrics to that we were keeping a, a very close eye on are well, what are the uninstalls and the installs? Have, have that been uh, impacted by this decision? Uh, and no, they haven't. You know, installs are actually uh, up and uninstalls are actually down since that point. So, you know, I don't think it's because of that that their the installs are up, uh, other than just the, the the press perhaps that you know came uh, came around it. But uh, uninstalls being down is great. You know, uh, so I think <laughs> by every metric that we we uh, conceive, it, it seems like uh, it was a good decision. Our users are are um, staying around and new users are joining every day. So I think it was a good move. Yeah, great to see. Okay. Let's talk about PayNIMS, BIP47. Now, earlier you mentioned about the problem of 
people putting up addresses on their, say, on their social media account, and now that is forever tied. Tell us a little bit about Paynims and how that can help. Yeah, well, I, that that's like a, one of the the perfect use cases for Paynims. Uh, it's the, the 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 public donation address problem. Like you want to receive donations uh, from the public uh, in a, in like you know in the in a very simple way. That's what Bitcoin has has promised, right? Here here's a QR code. Send me some BTC. You don't have to ask me for anything. I don't have, you know everything is is good. Well, the issue with that is you're you know publicly associating. An, a, an identity, whether it's your life, your true life identity, or it's some other sort of uh, digital identity, you're still linking that to that particular address. Um, and and uh, anyone who who sends to it is linking themselves if they've made their addresses known to to you. Uh, this is this is a privacy problem, uh, especially considering when you consider the fact that the the, the blockchain is immutable and this can go back and people can look through this for uh, posterity forever, uh, this becomes a privacy problem. And BIP47 allows you or solves this problem by allowing you to share a, a static code that doesn't change, um, but has the, has the ability to uh, allow users to send B, uh, Bitcoin to that, that, that code, let's say for simplicity's sake, Without revealing the balance for one of the uh, of the donation's address or the transaction history, so what ends up happening is a unique what we call a stealth address is generated between the sender and the owner of the code of the payment code, and uh, each person who sends is going to have different addresses generated based on you know their own their own wallet. So it, it's a very it's a very nice solution to the static address problem it's 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 similar uh in what it achieves to what dark wallet did with uh stealth stealth addresses um with the the difference being it doesn't rely on a server it just relies on the uh, on the blockchain uh to to achieve that that goal yeah fantastic okay and so then really the only downside is just that you would have to you wouldn't be able to instantly send a payment through you would have to open a kind of a paynim channel yeah. with that person and then send through yeah, the shared so secret that's yeah that's a pretty big downside it's actually you know i would i would classify it as a major downside for for a couple of reasons actually the the first reason is it's a ux disaster you know like okay now i have to wait for a blockchain confirmation uh, by by the time you do that, unless you're really dedicated, you're not sending that donation. Let's be let's be honest, you know. So that that that, that alone needs uh, needs needs to be solved. But but also, uh, I, I believe that uh, Luke Junior Luke Dash Junior brought this up when when Justice Ranvier when Justice Ranvier, uh, introduced the BIP for for uh, reusable payment codes, is that really the the notification transaction is kind of unnecessary, and it, and I think Luke put it as he he saw it as spamming the blockchain. I, I wouldn't go that far. I disagree with that, but I, I do think it is maybe a bit unnecessary. Uh, I understand why the notification transaction exists, and it, in fact, it exists um, because, as I, I just finished saying, it doesn't require a server. It requires the blockchain uh, when you when you restore, especially from monomic. Um, in order for your wallet to be able to determine, you know, the addresses it needs to generate, the stealth addresses it needs to generate, it needs to figure out, well, who connected to me, and it does so through those notification transactions. Um, however, we've been working on on solving that problem, um, and we're gonna we we have a um, a directory of payment codes called Paynim.is. And I think within the you know in the next definitely next year sometime there's going to be a an opt-in paynim.is sort of bridge so that users who want to do an instant payment would be able to do so in a in a private manner without you know without sacrificing any privacy um, with different trade-offs and the trade-off being the ex uh, the restoring from blockchain versus restoring from a encrypted you know. A payload on a server or something like that, uh, of of which payment codes connected to which payment co to to you or vice versa. So there, there's different there's different trade offs in solving that problem. 
uh, again, that's more of like the, like I said, the stealth address model. Um, so we'll see what users opt into. It really is what it comes into down to at the end of the day. Um, okay. Yeah, cool. Nice. Um, all right. Let's talk about Ricochet. Now, I thought this was an interesting feature as well. So I was reading about this and uh, maybe, actually, maybe you can tell, give the audience just a quick overview on what it is and you know how effective it is, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, so so Ricochet, we got the idea of Ricochet from a uh, a talk uh, at a conference that Adam Back and and uh, Matt Carallo did, where they he mentioned that the blockchain analysis companies were were looking back at usually at most around four to five. We, we'll call them hops backwards of a transaction's history um, and determining whether anything fishy happened within those those hops. Um, well, I mean, really, if you think about that, that's that's madness. Five five transactions ago can be anyone, you know, like that that the associating that to the person who's who's sending now is is kind of a, a reach. Um, so, so we had the idea, and it's a very simple idea, of, of Ricochet, which is, okay, well, let's just add hops of history before the transaction reaches its final destination. Because it's not like this is some sort of sophisticated thing they're doing. They're just looking back five and seeing if you know, any of those UTXOs or that transaction matches anything on their, their blacklist. And if it doesn't, all right, it gets passed on through. It's like the... I don't know a, a customs check. You know, a really uh, <laughs> unmotivated uh, customs official. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. You know that sort of thing. They're they're doing it. They're doing they're get they're doing their duty, right? But are they really? So we said, well, we can we can easily thwart this. This is easy to to thwart. So we did. We we created Ricochet. Um, we'll add uh, four hops to your transaction. So it'll be looks like a total of five hops. Um, and we launched that uh, a, little, a little more than a year ago. And we've had a lot of users, a lot of usage on it. And we've never had a complaint. We've never had someone say that they've uh, their account got shut down or anything like that. So it appears to be working. It appears to be effective. A lot of repeat uh, users, at least that's what people tell us. So um, I think it's a, it's a cool feature. And it also, it also, it's a premium feature. You know, users pay for this feature. Which is honestly one of the ways that we keep we keep going, we keep running. It's able to at least pay for the uh, server bills right, for our node and stuff. So it's it's an important feature for us, but it's also I think an important feature for the ecosystem. And uh, it's also really important to understand in order for the chain chain analysis people to combat this, they need to increase their costs, right? Because think about it. You're checking the, the last five hops of every transaction that's coming into this platform. So we're not talking like, you know, a couple couple hundred, a couple thousand. We're talking on these big platforms, 20, 30 million with 20, 30 million users. You think about think about that, right? Now, so you got it down to, okay, you're doing four or five hops on these and that's working good. What, you're going to start extending that to seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hops? Not only is that going to cost you more money in, in just raw processing power, that's going to cost you lost revenue in terms of your user base either getting incredibly fed up by these false positives that are being thrown out and going to your competitor. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really as simple as it comes down to the economics of things. So I think um, that's, that's probably the reason why we haven't seen any real response from, from the exchanges or anything like that to Ricochet. Uh, they haven't increased their hops. It doesn't appear, uh, probably right. because why would they? Like it, it's not you know. Okay, this is good enough. It passes muster, five transactions, and it's good. Yeah, and like you said, it would be very because then they might start actually pinging innocent. You know, from their own point of view, well, they, they might. They start, already will be. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you, going five hops back, I mean, you're already going to be getting innocent people, without question. That's a lot yeah. of transaction history. Yeah. And I like the other thing, the point you were making is that whole asymmetry around the cost to kind of implement this kind of defense versus the cost of a blockchain attacker to try and attack 
you, like the computational cost on their side is much higher than you know yes. the defensive cost. Yeah, it's just changing a variable for us, um, and, and that and that's not even I didn't even mention that we have planned improvements for Ricochet. Um, we're testing right now um, a Ricochet that goes uh, adds transaction history with end lock time oh, wow. between different between different uh, blocks. Right, so you can start on on uh, you can start your ricochet on this block today, right now, and then the next hop will be uh, the next block or two blocks from now. The final block, you know. So by the time your transaction actually reaches its destination, it could be like twenty five blocks from when it started. That ricochet um, that just breaks the the ricochet fingerprint almost completely, uh, detecting that on their end. So this is like think us thinking adversarially now. This is like us thinking, okay, what if they start to attack ricochet? What if they say, okay, we're going to fingerprint all these ricochets and and you know now we're going to come down extra hard on these people? That's how we're thinking. So this multi-block ricochet would would be a very strong solution to that. Yeah, right. And as you say, it's it's like um, people use that expression in security that it's like a cat and mouse game that you constantly you try you you know one side goes up one and then the other side tries to go up even further and you know. Um, yeah. Now, actually, that's an interesting point I wanted to ask as well. Is just around, you know, like with vaccines and this concept of sort of herd immunity. Is there such a similar concept in Bitcoin that if enough people use these kinds of privacy preser- preserving features, such as CoinJoin and Ricochet and Stonewall, that you know even users who don't use those features get p- protected? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I think. I think Adam. Um... Gosh, he, he wrote a Medium article about about this. Um, I, I, the title's escaping me, but it was really good. And it's basically, oh no, privacy is teamwork. Um, is the is the article of um, Adams and Fiskor, I mean, and it, it's uh, yeah. it, and it, and it, it's absolutely true. And and um, it's about incentivizing the people to use it, and it's about you know realizing that this isn't about protecting criminals. This isn't about trying to help people launder money or anything like that uh, if you even subscribe to that concept uh this is this is not about that this is about fundamental rights and and the the, the right to privacy in 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 transactions i think is is not something that's negotiable and it's something for everyone it, it's as fundamental as as the right uh, as freedom of speech in fact it is free it, it's part of speech you know, Fantastic. How, how you transact is, is is tantamount to speech. So you know it, it's just not negotiable. Um, and I think, and I would love, you know, obviously protocol level privacy improvements. Uh, I think that'd be a huge step, right? Uh, just to getting that that default position. But until that time, um, we need to focus on building tools that are going to hit, you know, are going to reach a large portion of the market. Even people who maybe wouldn't even subscribe to those tools, just like uh, like WhatsApp, you know, with their encryption probably very imperfect, but it it brought that encryption to the to the masses, uh, and brought yeah. even just the word encryption to them because it gives you gives you a nice little notice when you when you have a uh, WhatsApp in there. Uh, so so that I mean that's that's the sort of kind of shift I'm talking about. You need that, and that's not something that Samurai Wallet can do alone. You know, that's that's a that's a concerted effort type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And one thing you pointed out earlier is just around the incentive as well. So if there's one pathway that costs money and another pathway that is not so costly, well, people might take that path. Uh, actually, while we're on that topic, a related feature is Stonewall. So my understanding is that is a feature that is implemented by default in yes. the wallet. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, Stonewall essentially, um, well, it creates transactions that are mathematically indistinguishable from a coin join transaction, um, and, and by by extension, visually um, indistinguishable. So it looks like it's, it looks like a transaction uh, that multiple participants have have joined together to create uh, a standard mixed transaction. It would look like a transaction from from Wasabi, for example. Um, from sort of from join market, uh, et cetera. However, it's not, it's, it's, it's just your wallet. It's a decoy. It's fake. 
it's a fake coin join. Um, however, this ties into what we were talking about earlier about breaking these assumptions and breaking the heuristics that these analysis firms use. Um, mathematically, they cannot determine uh, with any certainty that that the inputs in a Stonewall transaction belong together, belong to the same wallet. Uh, and likewise, they can't determine which of the outputs was changed and which wasn't with any, any degree of certainty. Right, I see. And, I, and my understanding then is that the wallet kind of does some clever coin selection to craft the transaction in such a way. So is there a method to do like manual coin selection in Samurai or is it more just like it automatically does it? Um, so, so, well, yeah, so coin selection is a huge topic, huge, huge topic. Um, by default, like you said, Stonewall coin selection is the algorithm that's, that's used. And, um, we can, we can give your listeners a, a link to a, a GitHub gist of the, of a breakdown of the algorithm by Samurai Dev. Um, but, but essentially, essentially, uh, UTXOs are grouped and put into these randomized uh, sets based on the address type. So whether they're uh, P2PKH or uh, P2P or P2WPKH or whatever they are, um, they're put into random uh, in sets and are processed in randomized order. Um, so, so because of these conditions, uh, not every transaction can be a Stonewall transaction. And the wallet will alert you when a Stonewall transaction cannot be composed uh it's sort of the more you use the wallet the more likely it will uh activate um if if the you know stonewall can activate there's other coin selection um rules that that are applied in samurai wallet and i i would think most most uh good wallets uh, merge avoidance so if, if if utxos have been seen together uh in, in a previous transaction don't don't use them again uh, it would don't use them in in a transaction together again. Uh, so that's that's a simple kind of uh, selection technique to just uh, to avoid that merge of uh, that merging inputs issue. Uh, again, if you're doing a full wallet spend, you know the you really can't get around mer uh, merging inputs. But the wallet again will warn you and say, "Hey, you're going to merge these inputs. Are you sure you want to do that?" Yeah, that's clever. I like that. Um, and sort of related as well is um, I was reading on your blog that one of the ways that you analyze these transactions is by using what's called Boltzmann scoring. Uh, do you want to just give the audience just a, a brief overview of what that is and how that works? Yeah, well, I was, I was, I was just going to get there, actually, because it does tie in. You know, it ties into coin selection. To date, most of the academic papers and most of the research on UTXO selection has been uh, largely around amount and age. So what we're doing is taking that a step further, and this is how Boltzmann ties into that, where Boltzmann looks at a little bit more than just um, uh, amount and age of a UTXO. It's, actually, it's also looking at um, what's called its uh, entropy and, or, and also its wallet efficiency and um of a transaction right so uh the entropy of a transaction you can think of as the uh number uh, of combinations between that that can be that are that are mathematically possible between inputs to outputs and how many different ways can you break this transaction down and say this this input is to this output or this output is to this input etc um and this, the second one is wallet efficiency, um, which is the number of deterministic links. And that's saying, okay, well, we can deterministically say that this input is is put to this output. And th there's very complicated math behind this. Uh, and luckily, uh, Laurent, who who runs OXT, has a very strong mathematical uh, uh, interest. And he's the one who put these tools together. So, so what we're able to do is leverage these tools, um, like Boltzmann, to to select UTXOs that uh, maximize privacy for the uh, for the end user. So this hasn't this hasn't necessarily been rolled out yet. Where this is stuff is still in testing, but uh, so UTXO selection is something that we're we're really focusing on in a in a research and development capacity. Um, the the one the one kind of quirky feature that we do have, just jumping back to coin uh, coin selection or coin control, at least on the user's end. Um, so, 
we will have the ability to to have finer grained coin control in the wallet in the future saying i want to actually spend from these particular utxos in my wallet and and um alert the user if they're doing something kind of dumb but right now what you can do in the wallet is mark a utxo as unspendable so you can kind of reverse coin control yourself right you can say i don't want to spend this one and i don't want to spend this one so you kind of force the wallet into <laughs> into a situation um, that 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 can actually be be useful uh, for a number of reasons. But we implemented that that functionality uh, to protect another against another type of privacy invasion, which doesn't happen that much anymore, but was kind of popular two or three years ago, which is a um, a dusting attack. So a small amount of of Bitcoin is sent to your wallet. It's usually the dust limit, and um, you know, oh, yay, great, free Bitcoin. Uh, but then <laughs> you spend that Bitcoin and it, it, it usually has to be merged into a transaction um, with other, you know, other inputs because it's such a small amount. Um, and then, yeah, then they got you, right? Now they now they have a chain. And that's 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 another way of that starting uh, attack, right? You, you didn't maybe didn't even, you didn't, uh, you, you somehow put this address somewhere that they that they were able to put it or they just kind of generated rant, you know a bitcoin address has been sent to them various different methods but you, you know you may have done nothing wrong but now you're in their scope right now you're tracked so with samurai wallet you can uh, mark that as do not spend and your wallet will never spend that thing the true hodlers option <laughs> <laughs> well that's the other thing yeah we've had people who have said to us yeah you know this is great i i, I mark half of my wallet as do not spend uh, I forget that I even have it there because we remove it from the balance. Like you don't see it at all, right? You have to go back to your UTXO list and then mark it as spend. <laughs> so some people have said it's like finding like a, a $20 bill in your back pocket, you know? <laughs> well, it's a new age and we need uh, new analogies. <laughs> and new, um, it's almost like a Trojan horse attack. And and here's the other thing, actually, that um, it means anyone who's using a public donation address is kind of vulnerable to this attack if you if they if someone sends you dust whereas if you use pay nims then that that attack is now obviously a lot less viable no that's right yeah yeah so now the next thing i wanted to talk about and i've seen um one of your fellow samurai you know wallet partners uh t dev yeah he wrote yep he wrote about stowaway which is i think it's a new feature you guys are working on and in the wording TDEV said, it was neither output displays the true spend amount, which is in effect stowed away via a trusted cooperation between two wallets. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so, so stowaway is is a unique transaction type um, that's going to be available uh, at, after a user has whirlpooled their, their funds. Um, and this is a what we call a post mix transaction. One of the you know uh, we we can't forget that you have to spend your mixed BTC at some point, or you don't have to, but many people will, um, and that can undermine your privacy quite a bit uh, if if not handled with care. So a a, a post mix transaction, uh, well, a stowaway will be one of one of three post mix transactions. So transactions out of the mix. Um, and the, the stowaway has, has the asterisk that this is between Samurai wallet users, presumably because it requires a, uh, a paynim. So, uh, as of now it's, it's Samurai wallet and, and a few other wallets out there that even support, uh, BIP 47. So, uh, you know, it, it, it it's requires a paynim and it requires a paynim, uh, that, you have some level of trust with right and and does it mean they could steal your coins or does it just no. mean they might help de-anonymize or so they'll they they definitely can't steal your coins um or have or even have access to to know what your balance is or anything like that um the type the way the transaction works is you're essentially uh send you're sending to them right i want to send you uh one one bitcoin and I have one uh, UTXO of two Bitcoins, let's say, right? So my, my transaction, if it was just a normal transaction, it would be on the input side, two Bitcoins. 
on the output side to you would be one Bitcoin and there would be a change um, output back to myself for one Bitcoin, right? That would be the, the standard transaction. Now, when we apply the stowaway uh, transaction to it, so the, the input is two still from me. However, you, uh, the trusted part comes into play where I say to you who I'm sending to, I say, uh, give me another UTXO in your wallet. Not get, don't send it to me, but give me this information. So the trust comes in where I say I can look at that one UTXO. And in this case, you have one UTXO of two Bitcoin as well. So the, the, we use that UTXO of two Bitcoin that you also have. So your transaction now has an input of two from me, an input of two from yourself, an output of, of, of three to you, and an uh, output of one back to me. Oh, very nice. Right. So yeah, that's so, pretty cool. Yes. And so again, it's, it's very specific. Stowaway is very specific. It's like I need to send to one of my trusted contacts. Right. Uh, because again, trusted only because they're going to they're going to be exposing this UTXO that they have. Um, so you need you need to know who you want to send to, essentially. Um, and they need to participate in the send. If that makes sense, it's, it's, it's complex and it, it, it's not even we didn't come up with this and we don't want to take credit for this because this is even this is just too cool. Uh, this was this uh, Greg Maxwell came up with this years ago. We just unearthed it on the Bitcoin talk uh, message boards and it didn't go anywhere. I, I think he, he composed one of these by hand, one of these transactions by hand. Uh, you know, people on the message board were contributing UTXOs. To, to be used, for example, uh, and that, but it kind of ended there. So we found that and said, "Wow, this is a really interesting transaction type. It's essentially a mini coin join because you you're 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 collaborating with one other person. You're not doing a larger coin join with multiple participants. You're doing a one one person or a two person uh, you know transaction. But it's essentially a, a very small coin join." Um, so we were excited about that and we thought it would be a, a very nice post mix, uh, method to leave the mixing wallet. And if it, it, thinking abstractly about it, what it's doing, it's not just be, oh, this is a neat kind of uh, you know, trick. What it's doing is it's again, attacking those assumptions. It looks like a very normal Bitcoin transaction, very standard. However, it's not both those inputs aren't owned by the same wallet. Um, you know, you can't connect those. So that looks like your bog standard transaction and it's a mini coin join. So the, the assumptions that a lot of these blockchain analysis firms are going to, uh, are making are now going to just be dead wrong. Yeah. It's a very clever idea. And with the coin join idea, you sort of have to wait for a round and that might be, take, might, that might take time. Whereas in this method, it's just you and one other person. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the coin join, you may have to wait for a round. I, it, we don't expect uh, we'll have to wait around all that long. Um, it's kind of one of the the good things about being on mobile. Um, you'll have a, a fairly large user base that doesn't really have to do anything. They don't have to install anything. They don't have to compile anything. They don't have to do do much. Uh, you know, so the barrier to entry is a lot lower. Um, and the, one of the one of the differences between uh, zero link and uh, as just as a uh, framework and whirlpool as a product is that whirlpool is adding on a incentivization layer um, so we expect that liquidity will be it will be deep and uh, and um, rounds will be very will be lightning quick right okay what's the incentivization layer uh, we're, we're not not 100% ready to to go into it, but 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 I will say it's been it's been uh, inspired by uh, Join Market, which I've always admired, uh, especially the, the economics of the incentivization. I think it's very very clever. Uh, I think they they had uh, the same issue that I was just talking uh, talking about, where it's just a barrier to entry to use it to using that product. So so it's inspired by that, not not exactly the same um, maker taker model kind of idea, but uh, we we think that I think we think it's going to be pretty pretty awesome, and I can't wait to really kind of uh, get into it in more detail. 
Okay. Uh, next topic I was keen to hit was this concept of trusted node. Now, there has been a little bit of debate on Twitter. There were a few people making comments. I think Luke JR and David Harding um, were commenting that apparently the trusted node is potentially exposing users to some more risk if they don't execute it correctly because the method you know, involves exposing their RPC port to the internet. Do you have any comments on that or maybe what is the correct recommended way to use this? Yeah, um, sure. You know, I, for one, I think I think it's important to say that it's very, very difficult to have any sort of meaningful debate or or not even debate, but conversation of important things like this on Twitter. So I think it would have been a lot better uh, to be handled either on GitHub or on uh, on email uh, or something along those lines. So it, it just made it much more difficult to to keep track of of the thread uh, and, di- and all the divergences of the thread, and also to combat the frankly uh, misinformed or uh, mistold information that was going around. Uh, it makes it very difficult for for us to be able to, to counter that. So hopefully in the future we'll be able to to take that sort of stuff to GitHub. Um, uh, that being said, I I, I think I, I think that. Um, there, the RPC um, method of connecting to the user's full node, while imperfect, is not a gaping security hole. I, I think Luke probably means that in the same way that he means you know the tonal number system will be easier for the common man. Uh, uh, and I don't mean that with disrespect, because I respect Luke uh, a lot. Uh, but I, I, I think he meant that in the same kind of way. Um, it's you know I personally disagreed when Bitcoin Core removed, um, S- well not SSL but they re- they removed SSL uh, in zero dot twelve um, because of well SSL is a, is a nightmare. However, they should have replaced it with TLS in my view, and that would have that would have maintained the encrypted state of the RPC. So uh, BTCD does this by default and. Um, most, you know, most RPC um, methods also uh, do SSL or TLS. So I, I don't think it's it's entirely fair to to blame us for users doing silly things uh, to bypass, you know, stuff that uh, has been has been made on the node level. Uh, the 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 suggestion is to do SSH tunneling, but it's that's not very easy to do on a on a mobile device. Um, and at the time. There was the tour option wasn't really available to us, so you know, the, in the context of when we launched Trusted Node around the UASF uh, event, I think it was very important, and it still remains important for users who are running their own node. Um, I, one of the things Luke said was that it it is ineffective. That is not true. It is effective. It does exactly what it's described to do. Um, it does broadcast your transactions from your personal node, not from some a node. Uh, where you control the consensus rules, uh, it it um, d- gets the proof of work headers from your node and compares them to our node. And if there is a divergence, it alerts you and warns you, says something is not right. This was this was implemented uh, at the advice of Peter Todd, who um, suggested it on Reddit, um, and also was very important in the context of UASF. If our nodes lied to you uh, you know we were very supportive of the user activated soft fork and we said that uh we we warned users that our nodes would be following the user activated soft fork in the case of that split however we could have been lying and users were trusting us uh, and we've been very open and honest about our architecture that you still rely on samurai wallet you still trust samurai wallet to give you right information that's one of the reasons why we're alpha you have to trust us for that and we're working very hard on making that not the case, but until that you know that's released, uh, it is the case. Sure, sure. Uh, so, so in order in order to combat that around this very contentious time of user activated soft work, we said, well, if a user is expecting uh, to be following user activated soft work and they're running their own full node and they're broadcasting via their own full node. Uh, and their full node then report, or, or their Samurai wallet then alerts them that says, hey, your full node and our node has a different proof of work header. You know something's wrong now. 
you know, so that was that was the idea around that, and that is working. That's that's not ineffective. Uh, and then the last uh, the last thing it does right now is um, get the um, the fees from the mempool from your local mempool um, on your node. So that's what it does right now. And we've always been open that there's plenty more uh, planned for trusted node. The 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 ideal um, end state of trusted node is bypassing Samurai's infrastructure entirely. Uh, and and by by uh, you know the next step that we have to do to to help make that possible, I mean we are well we're like weeks away from that. This has just been kind of bad timing for us, but I mean we're very close on that feature. So um, on the one hand, it was it was unfortunate to have to deal with that and kind of the anger of it on that day, but I'm I'm not too worried about it because I know what we have in the pipeline. And um, most of all of the issues that were, were were raised have already been resolved. They just haven't been rolled out yet. So, okay, sure. Okay, well, I guess we'll look out for the uh, the update coming in a couple of weeks. Then, uh, all no, right, um, not in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, it, it's coming, uh, but I can't give it a hundred percent timeline yet. I would say, sure, month is is probably better. Okay, sure. All right. Um, now, the other thing that's really exciting that a lot of people have been talking about is this TX Tenor or Go Tenor collaboration. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Uh, that was that was fun. That was a cool project to work on with the Go Tenor guys. So we, we launched uh, Mule Tools a little while ago, which is, is one of our research and development initiatives around censorship resistance. So all sorts of different ways of broadcasting transactions and getting block data and without using the internet. So Gotenna stumbled across this. I think I think Richard Myers, who who's uh, their uh, centralized app engineer or something over there, he 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 came across it and he reached out to us and like made all the connections happen. Um, and we we met up with Gotenna, and they they showed interest in in bringing uh, Bitcoin to their users and to bringing Gotenna to our users. Um, and we thought it was a really cool uh, project that fell in line with the Mule Tools initiative. So we, we conceived of a way to uh, expand our current um, proof of concept app that we had at the time called Pony Direct. And what Pony Direct did was broadcast transactions via SMS network. Uh, pretty handy if you're outside of like 3G, if you're on edge or something um, or, or worse or, you know. Uh, we decided, okay, let's extend that and make it SMS based or Gotenna mesh network based. If you have a, a Gotenna and you're in, a, in an area that's nicely connected, um, so that that's kind of what we ended up working on. And uh, it kind of it, you know it followed the same ideas of the SMS based uh, solution. Uh, used kind of the same you know the same architecture, breaking up the transaction into segments. Um, in its own sort of payload format, so that they could be reassembled uh, later on. And all of that's open source. Uh, the app came out uh, at the HCPP conference in Prague. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's cool. Fantastic. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. I saw uh, there was a guy, I can't remember his name. It might have been CoInsure or CoInsure yes, yes, New Zealand. Yeah. yeah, so I think he did one where he paired up uh, a bunch of uh, GoTenners along a route and i'm not sure if he used samurai wallet i think he did um to then actually do a bitcoin transaction on it as well which was really cool so yeah i think he has like the distance record i think now it's very very long distance yeah so um as safety said it, it, you've got to envision an even more crazy scenario for bitcoin to get shut down now with uh, this kind of technology available yeah, and I mean, more and more is is, is coming every day. Uh, I saw I saw something go by, which is broadcasting, you know, transactions over uh, with Morse code over radio uh, now. And that's there's some working code on that, and uh, we forked it in the Mule Tools repository. But I think that was uh, Matoshi on Twitter who did that one. So that's pretty neat. And uh, yeah, a lot of people are inspired, and a lot of people uh, should be inspired. And and these sorts of tools. You know, while they may seem like kind of novelties right now, may become extremely important and maybe already are extremely important. 
Yeah, depending where you live. Yeah. Um, and, th- and then the other thing now, I-, I noticed, speaking of New Zealand, they passed a law recently saying, I-, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, if you don't uh, open your phone and also type in the password for the agents when you're trying to you know, come into the airport, they can fine you or they can put you in jail. Um, so that you know brings up this idea of being able to you know hide your wallet, have stealth mode and remote right. commands. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a use case. You can definitely do it. It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't hold up. I mean, I'm going to be honest. It wouldn't hold up to any real scrutiny of the device. If um, if you unlocked your device and gave it to you know border security, who whoever was examining it, and they took it away for long enough, they would be able to find your wallet if you had it in hidden mode, and then you may be liable for all sorts of other criminal charges. Yeah, my, right. My, my recommendation, and I've been I've thought about this a lot, is to um, just well, uh, you know, for Samurai Wallet, what a user could do if they've noted down their monomic and and their passphrase is just simply uninstall the wallet and then reinstall it when they're over the border and restore it. Like that. That's that's the the I think the most legal way of of doing it, right? Because then you're not right. deceiving anyone and and you're not um, trying to skirt any sort of laws or anything like that. Right. right. If, if, okay. If, if, if the, the idea of stealth mode, uh, and it, it is very useful in casual examinations. So someone is perusing your phone for whatever reason. There's nothing on the the home screen. There's certainly nothing in the the launcher. Uh, in order to activate it, you have to dial a special code. However, if if they started drilling down into the settings, for example and drilling down into the uh, app permissions, they, they would see it in there. So if they knew what they were looking for, they'd be able to find it. So I don't want to give anyone any false impressions of that. Um, but for a casual someone at the bar who picks up your phone and looks through it for a Bitcoin wallet or you know banking apps or anything like that, they're not going to find it. Yeah, and that's a good uh, way to help uh, keep that hidden a little bit at least. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about... Bitcoin privacy tech, it's evolving over time. You know, there's talk about confidential transactions. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or um, actually, also on the topic of confidential transactions, do you have any thoughts on this whole idea of perfect binding versus perfect hiding? Uh, uh, the only the only thing I can say about confidential transactions is, I, you know, we, we want to see it live on on mainnet we want to see it on the platform i i i've said it before in other in other interviews I, i'm skeptical that we would ever see that on a protocol level just because of the implications of it i hope i'm wrong We're, it's kind of a, a wait and see on that but uh, as into the intricacies or uh, no i don't have any uh any sort of uh opinions on that right now sure sure and then how about any of the other you know coming bitcoin whether they're a bip or a concept such as you know this concept of schnorr aggregated signatures mm. or channel factories any thoughts on those uh yeah we're very we're very excited for schnorr i think that would that would that um creates a huge uh, amount of innovation or unleashes a huge amount of innovation that's kind of waiting on that so schnorr would be huge um we're uh, excited for dandelion um we'd like that pretty much as soon as possible um I'm not. I'm not familiar with the uh, channel factories uh, off the top of my head. I have to look into that. Okay, and then how do you see the relationship between Bitcoin wallets and Lightning wallets? So, do you think of it like all Bitcoin wallets will eventually incorporate Lightning, or do you think it's more like they serve different roles? So, for example, I know you have another product which is called the Sentinel, which allows a user to basically put in their XPub and use it like a watching wallet. So, do you see it? Do you see it like people might have a, a Sentinel or a Bitcoin style wallet and then a Lightning for day to day spend? And what would that look like in practice? Would users just walk around with two wallets on their phone? That's yeah, a good question. I've thought a lot about it, uh, to be honest. And I, I think it's, um, I think one thing that we can be certain of is that users won't have any problem running more than one Bitcoin app on their phone, more than one Bitcoin wallet on their phone. I think many users do that already. Uh, and even outside of Bitcoin, you see many users running three or four chat apps at the same time. Uh, exactly. You know, so I, I, that I'm not, that uh, I think is a given. Uh, I think the what's going to end up happening is you're going to have specialization and you will have lightning specific wallets and you will have main chain wallets. Um, I think that's probably for the best as specialization is good um but maybe you know well you obviously will have 
uh, differences to that approach and you'll have outliers. And, and I guess we're just going to see what, uh, what what comes of that. But uh, yeah, a lot, a lot has to be d seen with lightning. Um, and it's, I, I, you know, uh, we're excited for lightning uh, as a technology. And I think it's important that the infrastructure is being built out now. Uh, I don't, th I don't see lightning as a, as one of the build it and they will come sort of things. I don't think it works that way with with Bitcoin. Uh, I think it's it's a matter of build it so when they come it's ready. And I, I'm I think that's a that's a very positive development in this space that that's being done. The infrastructure is being built out uh, in such a way that I think when when it's needed uh, it will be ready. Yeah, right. That's, I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, okay, so what about censorship resistance? So there are some recent examples of people getting shut down. For example, you know, famously, Alex Jones has been kicked off a lot of social media. Do you think it's likely that Samurai Wallet could eventually get kicked off Google Play Store or off Apple Store? And do you have any ideas on what to do in that case? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we've thought about. Um it would be crazy if we w we didn't think about that. Uh, right now, we rely on Google Play for distribution. It's the only distribution method we have, and that's entirely only to um, because it's an alpha build. Uh, restrict the number of APKs that are going out uh, out there. We want to make sure people are updating quickly and getting all the bug fixes that need to be you know they need to have. Uh, so it's uh, right now. It's kind of if Google Play was to say, "Hey, you're out," then we would be. We would we would be kind of in trouble. We have uh, contingencies, of course. Uh, there's no there's no reason why we couldn't go on to F Droid immediately. There's no reason why we can't do a, a self uh, self download APKs, um, third party other third party app store APKs. All of those are open to us, um, and we intend 100 percent to do both uh, self download APKs and F Droid for the 1.0 release. Um, so, you know, I think once we do that, uh, once 1.0 comes around, then we have now multiple methods of, of getting the product. I, uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, I remember in before, before Google Play allowed um, wagering and gambling apps in the Play Store, uh, which is a regulated and legal activity in, in many countries. <laughs> those... Okay, sure. those uh, those uh, companies, they still had mobile apps and they still distributed those apps to their customers and millions and millions of their customers use those apps. So, you know, I think if they were able to crack that distribution problem, um, we, we certainly will be able to take some cues from that. And I think if people want it, they'll get it, you know, and it may be even, uh, maybe it, it would even add to the, uh, you know, publicity around Samurai. Uh, these bad boys, they got kicked out, you know. Where can I find them? <laughs> yeah, no. Maybe, maybe it'll be like a Barbara Streisand. But, thing. Uh, that being said, I really hope it doesn't. Uh, we 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 review the Play Store terms of services as often as they change to make sure that we're not breaking any rules. Um, and we work with Google as well. We have a a um, liaison with Google um, who we can just say, "Hey, we want to do this. Is this okay?" And they can say, you know, that's that would probably break terms of service, or you shouldn't do that. So Google, it's been really, really easy to work with. Apple's a kind of a different story, um, and we're gonna we're gonna ebb on the side of extreme caution with Apple because you know getting onto the iOS store is is not only a, a large investment of time, but it also kind of a large investment in money, and getting kicked out is kind of a permanent deal. So we don't want that at all. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, I've got to ask. I, I personally, I'm an Android user, but uh, when iPhone version? <laughs> yeah, it's it's being worked on now. Sentinel's uh, essentially days away from coming out on the iOS store. Um, uh, Samurai Wallet itself is being developed, so we're hoping in the new year, uh, early new year. Okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, any other? I, I guess we've spoken about some of these features, but do you have any other features or releases coming up that you want uh, listeners to keep an eye out for? Oh gosh. Yeah, we kind of went through. I think everything on the on the uh, public side. I, you know, the um, trans the postmix transaction types. Those are kind of a big deal. Stowaway. I hope I did a good job explaining. That's kind of a complicated one to explain. 
Um, yeah, no, I thought it was good. Okay, <laughs> Ricochet, uh, all that sort of stuff uh, being improved. Trusted Node being improved, being replaced by what we're calling Dojo. I don't think I said that before, so that's that's your, that's a scoop. Very and, nice. And, you know, we're going to combine that with a partnership with a actual full node provider. Uh, so users will be able to have a true plug and play experience um, with a full node pairing to their mobile wallet uh, via Tor hidden service. So, I mean, like all, all this stuff is coming out and we're a very small team. We're self-funded. We, <laughs> our mission statement wasn't, isn't that you, that you read at the beginning isn't BS. Not only did, did, you know, VCs not want to invest, they really couldn't. There is no structure or entity to invest into. Uh, and, you know, VCs don't like that generally. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Well, on that topic, if someone wants to support you guys, how can they do it? You know, it's open source development. Can they contribute Bitcoin? Can they, you know, use Ricochet? Yeah. Yeah. All of the above. Um, we're available on GitHub. Uh, you know, you can go through issues on there. You could submit pull requests. Uh, chat with us, uh, you know, on Telegram and, and talk talk out some features. We can do that. That's cool. Uh, using Ricochet, honestly, it's it's the single biggest way you could uh, you could support us, and it uh, at least uh, monetarily. I mean, it and it um, just just use it. You know, use it sparingly. Use it when you're actually sending to an exchange. We met a guy at a conference, or a nice guy at a conference who. Was telling us, yeah, I just, I, you know, I just use Ricochet to buy buy this bottle of water, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, you don't, you don't need to do that, man. Like, uh, <laughs> you should use Ricochet when you're sending to Binance or Coinbase or something, you know. <laughs> uh, and donate, you can go onto SamuraiWallet.com/slash/donate, I think, and uh, we have a payment code on there, which which is what you should use. But we also have a static address if you want to send the old school way and and taint yourself. <laughs> well, I hope you've marked that address as do not spend. Yes, yes. That address is do not spend. <laughs> okay. And um, I suppose just last closing thoughts. Do you have any advice for users on maintaining privacy generally, n- not just in Bitcoin? Maintaining privacy generally. Uh, yeah, you know, check out Lop's uh, Twitter feed and read his resources. I think that guy has a pretty uh, has a pretty good grasp on the outside Bitcoin uh, privacy methodologies. Excellent. All right. Well, I think uh, that's pretty much going to do it for us. So, look, it's been a fantastic discussion. I think uh, it's been very educational. I've definitely learned a lot in terms of the ways you know the transactions can get constructed and various you know initiatives and projects that uh, you guys are doing. I think it's a pretty cool project. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It was uh, it was great. So there you have it, my conversation with Samurai Wallet. I thought it was a fascinating conversation and I really picked up some more knowledge on Bitcoin privacy, merge avoidance, coin selection, the state of currently available Bitcoin privacy technology such as Ricochet and Stonewall. I'm also quite excited to see some of the new features coming, such as improved Ricochet, Whirlpool and Stowaway, and the Dojo Trusted Full Node feature. For listeners who are new to my podcast, if you liked this episode, you will also like my earlier episode, SLP24, with Adam Fitchor of ZK Snacks. He is the CTO of the company and lead developer of Wasabi Wallet, another privacy-focused wallet project. Anyway... Samurai Wallet is available on Android, so go take a look. For my iPhone listeners, sorry, you'll have to wait a bit longer to try it. Lastly, please help me change the conversation from quote-unquote crypto and scammy altcoins, ICOs, enterprise blockchain technology projects to Bitcoin by sharing this podcast with your friends. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Telegram groups, Discord, WhatsApp, whatever you're using... I also really appreciate any good reviews you can leave for my podcast as that helps new people find my podcast. Come follow or DM me on Twitter at Stefan Levera. My DMs are open and I respond to just about everyone. That's it from me. Speak to you guys next time.